going to be looking at Neanderthal man, at least at the beginning of our lesson here. Uh, if you have the concept, most of us have a concept who Neanderthal man was, and if you don't have a concept, if you remember a few years ago there was a popular commercial, I think it was Geico, and they had the, the, the caveman, you know, remember it was so easy, a caveman can do it, something like that was the, the logo. And that, you know, that sort of is supposed to be, I guess, I guess Neanderthal man. <clears throat> and Neanderthal man, we would say, was a caveman. And so we're going to look at Neanderthal man and what evolutionists and uh, scientists have to say about him. Where did they get the name Neanderthal? Neanderthal came from the valley of Neanderthal. And by the way, Neanderthal, some people have a T, uh, an H after the T. Some people will leave the H off. So you'll see Neanderthal, Neanderthal. Uh, Marvin Lubinow uses Neanderthal, but everybody else uses Neanderthal, so uh, I'm using Neanderthal. It's the same, it's the same uh, 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 being. But these were found in the Valley of Neanderthal, which is in Germany, and uh, this was a, a finding that occurred in 1856, so it was, it was very early on, even at the time of Darwin, obviously, before, because it predates the, the um, Darwin's, uh, Darwin's book on Origin of Species. And of course, it was in the valley of Neanderthal, named after Joaquin Neanderthal, who well, lived there hundreds of years before. At the time, it was considered to be ancestral to modern humans. So when they found Neanderthal, they found, uh, again, kind of the missing link, so to speak, uh, and it's supposed to be definitely ancestral to human beings, uh, Homo sapiens. That's no longer felt to be the case, and we'll, we'll talk about that why later on. But uh, at the time, that was the case. At the time, there was a, a famous pathologist. His name was Rudolf Virchow. Virchow is well known by all medical students because there's different uh, diseases and, and pathological findings that are named after Virchow. And Virchow studied the remains of Neanderthal. And he came up with that, the fact that Neanderthal was human. He was Homo sapien. He was Homo sapien with rickets. Anybody knows what rickets is? Toby knows what rickets is. Does anybody else know? You know, vitamin D deficiency, severe vitamin D deficiency. And what happens when you have rickets is multiple things, but it, affect, it affects the bone structure primarily. And it'll, it'll affect, affect uh, the way the face looks. It'll affect uh, the stature. And you can see a bowing of the legs. We don't see that anymore. And I, I could dare say I've never seen a case of rickets in my practice and, and probably never will in this part of the world. We see vitamin D deficiency. In fact, I think it's kind of overdiagnosed now. But I, if we see vitamin D deficiency, in the United States because of our scare of uh, the sun now. People don't get out in the sun. They use so much sunscreen that we're seeing vitamin D deficiency in, uh, in, in women especially. Uh, but if you had it when you were a child, it would look something like that. And that would definitely affect the morphology, would it not, uh, significantly. So that's what Virchow said. And he said that like 100 years ago. Even, to, even uh, Thomas Huxley, remember who Thomas Huxley was? <laughs> Thomas Huxley was called Darwin's bulldog. Uh, and, and great proponent of evolution, but even Thomas Huxley felt that Meander Neanderthal man was indistinguishable from Homo sapiens. Uh, so ne Neanderthal man presents a problem for evolution, an evolutionist and paleontologist. And the problem is they don't know where he came from. And I say he, I'm talking about he and she, all the, all the Neanderthal, but you'll hear that term Neanderthal man, Cro-Magnon man, we're talking man in the generic sense here. We don't know where the Neanderthals came from. We don't know where they, where they originated. Furthermore, we don't know where they went. Okay? Supposedly, according to evolution, about 34,000 years, uh, years ago, they just disappeared from the scene. And people now believe, or the evolutionists now believe, they contributed nothing to the evolution of mankind. And again, we'll talk about the reason for that. But if you were to look at Neanderthal, that's a skull of a homo sapien, and that's the, uh, on the right. That's you and I, basically. And that's the skull of a Neanderthal. Doesn't look a whole lot different, does it? Uh, the Neanderthal morphology includes large cranial capacity. And we talk about cranial capacity in this class a little bit. And Neanderthals had a very large cranial capacity, very close to modern man, not quite, but, but very close, as you can see on there. Uh, they had a sh skull that was uh, shaped with a low, br broad, and elong an elongated skull. The rear of their skull kind of had a bun. You don't really get a good appreciation of that, but it's it not quite as rounded. It had kind of like a, a bun in, in, in the back. Heavy eyebrows, low forehead, uh, large long faces with the center of the face jutting forward, weak kind of rounded chin, post-cranial skeletal bones that were very thick, as well uh, as he being of short stature, as we mentioned. So that's the morphology of Neanderthal. That's what Neanderthal man would look like if you were trying to describe him. 
think about this is the Neanderthals' distinct morphology includes, uh, I just talked about that, the, 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 the morphological changes can all be explained by non-evolutionary processes. You don't need evolution to explain the way Neanderthal man looked. You know, the idea that he's looked that way because he predated man, not necessarily so. You could explain all of that by non-evolutionary processes, such as geographic isolation. If you take a, a, a Homo sapiens and you, you, you uh, separate them geographically by large areas uh, geographically, they're probably going to look a little different. You know, the Aborigines in, uh, in Australia look a lot different than, the, than Homo sapiens, let's say, in, in, uh, in Western Europe. And you can say the same thing about the, the Eskimos or the American Indians here. Their morphology looked a little bit different. So g just geographic isolation and then gen genetic recombination can explain a lot of it. And then the other things that could, be explained, that could explain the morphological changes include health factors, including vitamin D, as well as infectious, infectious diseases. They could have all explained the changes in, in uh, Neanderthal man. Nobody's saying that Neanderthal man looks exactly like us. But uh, in, in Dwayne Gish's book you know, that I read years ago, if he was walking down the street in New York City, you would say he looks a little bit strange, but you, wouldn't just, you would not say he did not look human. You would just say, no, nah, it looks a little bit different, you know. Of course, when you see the pictures and, and everything, they've always got all the hair and all the beard, and they're always unshaven and so forth. But the other thing about Neanderthal man is when we try to distinguish what, what if you're looking from an anthropologic point of view, what distinguishes humans from animals? Now, biblically, we know what the distinction is. You know, humans have souls. We have a, a soul that's, uh, that we're made in the image of God with. But if you're looking at it from an anthropologic point of view, what is characteristics, characteristic of humans that's different, let's say, from the primates or animals? And these are the things you would look for. And Neanderthal had all of these. You would look for, you know, do they have tools? Did they use tools to work with? And the answer is, from an anthropologic point of view, they did. They had hearths. What, what's a hearth? Uh, a hearth is, you know, what you, what you cook stuff in, you know, start fires in. So they had fire and they used them to cook with and so forth. They lived in structured areas. You don't see primates doing these things. You don't see apes or, or chimpanzees having tools or having hearths or living in structured. Yeah, I, I don't recall ever seeing a picture in National Geographic of the apes building uh, uh, lodgings to, to live in, right? And Neanderthal had that. They even had uh, boats that they were used for fishing, and they even had musical instruments. So to classify them as pre-human is a mistake. They were humans in all phases. And these are just some pictures that we found of some of the Neanderthal tools that they, that they used. So the conclusion is Neanderthal man was human. And I, like I say, even now, um, evolutionists don't put him in our evolutionary line. They say he's extinct. That's where he went. He contributed nothing. And that's because of the out of Africa model that we use now. They don't want to put mankind coming from Europe. That, that's you know, racist. And we'll talk about that next week or the week, at, the week after, probably next week. I do want to say something, though, about DNA. Because Toby asked a question at the very end of the lesson that I didn't answer very well. I gave him a poor answer. It kind of caught me off guard a little bit. So I want to, want to talk about DNA. Have they found DNA of these of these primates that we're talking about. Actually, they haven't found very much DNA, and there's a reason for that, but in 1997, they did recover some DNA from the humerus of a Neanderthal species. Uh, actually, what they recovered was mitochondrial DNA. Now, there's a big difference between mitochondrial DNA and, and, and uh, nuclear DNA. Mitochondrial DNA, in every cell of your body, there are mitochondria. If you remember your biology, you know that. The mitochondria are the kind of the engines of our cells. I remember that from first, my first uh, biology class from uh, Mrs. Good in, 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 uh, at Sam Rayburn High School. And uh, there's lots of mitochondria in your cells. There's only one nucleus in the cell. So if you look at the mitochondrial DNA, first of all, you're going to find your, your chances of finding mitochondrial DNA are much greater than finding nuclear DNA, simply because there's going to be a whole lot more of it. The other thing that's peculiar about mitochondrial DNA is that it tends to come only from the female side. The only, it, 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 the sequencing of the, of the DNA comes from the X chromosome. It's only the female side. Or at least that's what has been assumed for a long time. We're finding out that's not necessar necessarily true now. 
Uh, but because of that, because of that, you can look at the lineage, if you will, by the sequencing of the DNA. It's kind of like using a surname, going on Google and searching your, your family history, but just using a surname. Only this case, instead of a surname, it's the female name. Uh, and so if you had, you know, if your name is Smith, uh, years ago, it might have been S M Y T H. You know, and by looking at those different sequencing, the uh, the uh, scientists believe that they can use this mitochondrial DNA uh, to interpret lineage, to interpret how old the organism is, and they did that with uh, Neanderthal man. This was again fa fairly recent compared to a lot of stuff we study in here. 1997, it appeared in the in the in the uh, magazine Cell, which is, is a scientific magazine. And supposedly it showed that Neanderthal man uh, diverged from human evolution about 550 to 690,000 years ago and became extinct. And as I said, contributed nothing to uh, human DNA. There's a problem with DNA, by the way. First of all, and DNA is a very unstable molecule. It dies or di dies. It disintegrates very, very quickly. When the organism dies, the, the DNA disintegrates very, very quickly and it's very hard to recover. And they've used polymerase uh, uh, chemicals to try to uh, ferret out some of the DNA and, and it's very difficult to do. But the concept that you saw in Jurassic Park, I'm sure you remember Jurassic Park. They found the DNA of the dinosaurs in these uh, ancient eggs, I guess they were. Can't recall the story that well, but they recreated them through cloning. Remember that? That's totally farcical. That would never happen. You don't find DNA of dinosaurs. It's disintegrated. And if you do find DNA by implication, this is what I don't understand about the article, that by implication the DNA has to be pretty, pretty young. Can't be hundreds of thousands of years old. So when you do that, it, 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 the, you know, that, that kind of tells you something about that organism, uh, even if you're using the evolutionary uh, years model. The other thing is, and this is a real important problem, and we saw this a, a week or two ago when I discussed the DNA, uh, the DNA of Archaeopteryx. Remember when we were talking about that, um, that it looked like a turkey? Well, of course, that was nonsense. We knew better than that. And you know why the reason that that is? DNA, when you're doing meta-DNA analysis, it's very, very subjective to contamination, human contamination. So you never know for sure exactly what you've got. And as, uh, uh, it's impossible for us to know because of that whether or not these people, these scientists in 1997, actually have genuine DNA of Neanderthal. That's, that's one problem. So you use mitochondrial DNA to prove Neanderthal wasn't human, is biased, and as Marvin Lubinoff Marvin Lubin says, is nothing short of a scientific scandal. And because of several of the assumptions we've already talked about. And one is again, that the assumption that mitochondrial DNA is only passed by the mother. Not necessarily true, and we're finding that's not true more and more. There are some, there's some of the father contributes to that mitochondrial DNA. The other, I'm gonna give you a couple of assumptions. The other, the uh, other assumption is that mitochondrial DNA, uh, is, the mutations are regular. They are not sp uh, sp sporadic. You have to have regular mutations to use what's called the quote unquote molecular clock, as we've talked about in this class as well. And the age of mitochondrial DNA can be off as much as 20 fold, 20 fold. So if it's off as much by 20 fold in Neanderthal man, guess how old you have Neanderthal man being? 6,000 years old. So, I mean, that's, that's another problem or, or assumption. There's also assumptions that mitochondrial DNA can be used to determine human and uh, primate relationships. And here's the big problem there. They always start with a calibration point, which is an evolutionary assumption. And that is that we came from a chimpanzee. So they start with that assumption to begin with. It's again the old idea of circular reasoning. They calibrate it based upon that idea, which is a, which is a big assumption. The other assumption is that mitochondrial DNA can determine species dis, uh, distance and distinguish between species, and it cannot. And whatever the causes of the extreme variation of human mitochondrial DNA, and there's a lot of variation within our own species of mitochondrial DNA, just go from uh, uh, different, uh, different races to, uh, to other races. There is, there is a difference. But whatever those differences are, they cannot really be used to distinguish uh, species. And here's another problem. 
And this can be kind of a researcher bias, which we see in medicine a lot. We see it a lot. If you're, if you're, if you're a doctor and you're doing research for a certain, uh, a certain uh, drug company, pharmaceutical company, you're going to be biased to try to prove what they want you to prove. This happens in paleontology as well. And what happens is a lot of times that evolutionists will, dis will they will suppress the mitochondrial DNA which will, so, which will so show that the sequences of Neanderthal are similar to humans. They'll suppress that. They will amplify the differences. And so we have a problem. So the idea, the idea that, that we can use mitochondrial DNA to distinguish Neanderthal from humans is probably biased and probably wrong. And here's the other thing. When they've done mitochondrial DNA on Cro-Magnum men, we talked about Cro-Magnum a little bit, uh, when they've done that, the mitochondrial DNA between, uh, between Cro-Magnum uh, Cro and, and modern humans is indistinguishable. You can't tell the difference. So I don't know if that answered your question, Toby, but hopefully it did. I, and we'll, we'll look at that a little bit more uh, next week when we get into the idea of racism, when we look, we look at mitochondrial DNA in Lucy. Uh, they used mitochondrial DNA not to, to, to age Lucy. Remember, remember Lucy? And they used it on modern humans, and they looked at mitochondrial DNA of, of women. They went only to women. They looked at women all over the world, and then they tried to deduce where human beings started, and they deduced it back to a sub-Saharan uh, uh, individual that lived millions of years ago called, they, didn't, they, couldn't, they couldn't trace it back all the way to that remain Lucy, but where was Lucy found? Sub-Saharan Af sub Africa. All right, let's move on. Try to, try to get through this lesson today if we can. We're going to talk about Java Man real quickly. Java Man, also known as Pithecanthus erectus, now Homo erectus. And you'll see different names for these, for these remains, so it gets a little bit confuse, confusing. Homo erectus is a big term. It includes uh, the Java Man, includes uh, Cro-Magnum Man. And where was Java Man Guess found? <laughs> well, where would you think? Uh, Neanderthal was found in Neanderthal Valley of Germany. Java Man was found in uh, 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 Java. He was considered the true ape man, quote unquote. That's not, that's not me saying that, so don't quote me on that. But he was called the, the true ape man, originally referred to, uh, referred to as Pithecanthus erectus. Now they lump all those into Homo erectus. He was first discovered by actually a Dutch anatomist named Eugene, I would, I would think that's spelled, pronounced Dubois. That's how I'm going to say it anyway. In the Dutch uh, East Indies along the bank of the Solo River in Java, uh, which is uh, in, in, in Indonesia, just the place where it's found. What he found first was a skull cap, and then uh, a year later, about 50 feet away, he found the bone of a femur. Femur is your thigh bone. He assumed that the thigh bone went to the skull cap, but that was probably a big assumption, but he assumed it anyway. And uh, he believed, uh, uh, Dubois did, that the, uh, the skull cap was an ancient, ancient human species or a, a, pre, a precursor to, to humans. Uh, however, the, the femur, when looked at, is indistinguishable from modern humans. It looks just like a modern human. So Marvin Lubinow believes that Java man is not our an uh, evolutionary ancestor, but a true member of the human family, just a smaller version of Neanderthal. Part of the problem regarding Java Man was the dating of Dubois. Dubois was an anatomist. He wasn't a geologist. But yet he tried to date the area and probably misdated it significantly, and we'll show why in just a minute. Uh, so the, 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 uh, the dating was a problem. Uh, the other thing was the femur found, as we said, was in, indistinguishable that from, a, from a human femur. And the skull cap was considered similar to Neanderthal, but with a, a little bit smaller uh, capacity. Uh, Dubois got an interesting history, by the way. Dubois was, again, he was an anatomist, but he, he, he clung to Java Man, Homo erectus, because that was his baby, if you will. And if it's your baby, you're going to do everything you can to protect your baby, right? Because you want this to be your, your uh, part of history, making history. He went back to Java and or, or in, the, in the area of the East Indies, and he later on, a, a few years later, discovered someone called the uh, Wajuk man, sometimes spelled W-A-J-A-K, sometimes W-A-D-G-A-K. You will never hear about Wajuk man. I would, 
venture to say, unless you've read Marvin Lubinow's book, you probably have not heard of Wajuk Man. Do you recall, have any of you heard of him? The reason you want is evolutionists won't speak of him because they don't consider him anything more than just human anyway. At the time, that's the skull that, that he found. And it was very similar to Pithecanthropus. Very, very, very similar. Skull capacity was 1500 cc, 1600, so a little bit bigger skull capacity. And it appears to be truly human. He never published this data. That's the reason you haven't heard about him. He never published Wajunk Man. He did the studies on him. He didn't publish it. Can you imagine why he did not publish it? Because it would kind of put Pithecanthropus, Pithecanthropus uh, Homo erectus, at jeopardy. And he did not want to do that. So he never published it. He needed to save Pithecanthropus, thus saving his own reputation. No paleontologist now doubts that Wajunk Man, which is dated about 10,000 years ago, is anything more than human. But it was a problem for him. And the interesting thing about that was they found supposedly uh, uh, a very, very ancient Tiberius Indicus. They found it very close to this area. Okay, interesting finding of a fossil remain of Tiberius. Uh, ty uh, Tiberius Indicus, a, ta a taper that was supposedly extinct millions of years before. W you see an issue there? Because if you got what evolutionists are saying was a modern human being or a homo sapien that's no older than 10,000 years old, and at the same time you find this animal there, and this is their findings, not, not, this is not creationist findings, you either got to say, well, we were wrong about Tiberius, it wasn't really uh, ancient and extinct, or we're wrong about the fact that humans couldn't have been alive at the same time, and that's what I think the problem is. Humans were alive at the same time this animal was alive. Now, years later, uh, Professor Emil Selinka was preparing to go to the site where Dubois did his studies. Unfortunately for Professor Selinka, he passed away. He wasn't able to go. This was the early 1900s. So his wife went, and she was a professor too. So she had credentials as well, but she put a big team together. You won't hear about this very often either, by the way, what we're gonna talk about right now, because it's been somewhat suppressed. But Frau uh, M. Lenore Selinka organized another expedition to Java to explore where the original Pithecanthropus was found. The expedition became known as Selinka Trinell Expedition. Trinell is the area in Java where the expedition was carried out, and it was a very well documented research, 342 page research from all, and have many different scientists, not just one, not just Dubois. By the way, Dubois was basically a one man team. He had people doing all of his digging for him. He didn't find those skull caps, by the way, himself. He didn't find the femur. His people did, and they brought it to him. Now, if you're doing geological research, that could be a problem because you're, you're allowing for a lot of contamination when you do that. So his was not a good scientific expedition to begin with. This was. And guess what? They took geologists with them on this one. They didn't rely on just anatomists and paleontologists. It was a, it was a large team. Came, it came to be known as, again, the Selinka Tradell Expedi Expedition. No Pithecanthropus was found. They didn't find anything like Pithecanthropus on that expedition. Here's the important thing for you. The specialist in geology estimated the beds where Pithecanthropus would have been found, where Dubois, Dubois would have found him to be only 500 years old, not a million years old, not two or three million years old, not 650,000 years old. And guess what they found at the same site? A human tooth. The well-documented Selinka Trinell expedition has been largely ignored and what Lubinow refers to as an amazing conspiracy of silence. Paleontologists don't want to know about this. So you won't hear about the Selinka Trinell expedition, even though it's a 342 page document, well documented. And it's for obvious reasons. The findings contradict Eugene Dubois and would also put Homo erectus or Pithecanthropus in a much later evolutionary time frame. Is Homo erectus morpho uh, morphology distinct enough to warrant it being considered a separate species from human Homo sapiens, and are there non-evolutionary ideas to explain the morphology such as we saw in Neanderthal uh, man? The answer is no and yes. Uh, go back to the question. Um, th there are distinct, distinct uh, you know, there, 
there's not enough to consider distinct species and yes the morphology just like we talked about in Neanderthal could be explained by non-evolutionary processes and have been. So Homo erectus is fastly becoming the evolutionist's worst nightmare according to Lubinol. The problem is that some of the fossil remains are dated very old and some are dated very young. You got all kind of ranges of time from 1.5 million years to 27,000 years if you're using evolutionary time. And that's a problem. You got a large, what should happen within a million years? This is more than a million years, isn't it? 1.5 million versus 27,000 is more than a million years. There's a lot, large gap there. What should be happening then if you believe in evolution? Evolution should be going on, right? million years. We are not supposed to have been around for a million years. So you haven't seen the evolution in the Homo sapiens because we haven't been around long enough, according to evolutionary thought. If we're here a million years, we will not be Homo sapiens anymore, according to evolution. We should be changing. There's no evidence of that, by the way, but we should be. But if you've got fossil remains that are, mil there's a million year, a million, uh, uh, 1.4 million uh, gap, you should see a change evolutionary in these fossils, and quite frankly, they don't. So the problem, obviously, and then it also, just from an evolutionary point of view, they would say human beings have been around, you know, 10,000, 20,000 years ago, depending on what you look like, uh, look, look at, very similar. So Homo sapiens may have been around at the same time. So it's obvious problem for Homo erectus to coexist with humans, which these dates would allow and it would not work from an evolutionary point of view. For Homo erectus or any other species to exist two million years without significant evolutionary change would also violate evolution. There have been many record, there have been about 72 fossil records now of Homo erectus that are less than 30,000 years old. 20, 72, there's many more than 70, 72 fossils found, but at least 72 that have been dated less than 30,000 years and one that's been dated as young as 6,000 years from their own dates. And again, it's generally agreed by paleontologists that we've been around that long. So there's a problem there. Homo erectus, bottom line, coexisted with man because he was man, albeit shorter, and genetic variability allows that. Let's talk a little bit about genetic variability. What, what do I mean by genetic variability? Well, we all look different. You know, the, the skull caps, the skull capacity of humans is not exactly 2200 cc's, for every human being. Wouldn't that be obvious? If you were down in, uh, uh, again, not to pick on one, one race or not, but the, the pygmies of, of Africa are, are, are Aboriginal Australia, do you think their skull capacity is going to be the same as yours? Well, of course it's not. The, there's large genetic variation. Uh, Sha Shaquille O'Neal's skull capacity is probably bigger than mine, okay? He's got a bigger head. So there's a lot of genetic variability. So just because, and, and what evolutionists hone in on is the skull capacity when they're trying to distinguish species. That's it, because otherwise there really isn't no difference between, they will even admit this, there's really no difference between Cro-Magnum, between Homo erectus, between uh, Neanderthal. There's just no difference. It's all skull capacity. Genetic variability allows that. And we don't uh, seem like we forget that when we're doing these studies, because we've, we've, got, we've got our arrow pointed in one direction. You've heard of Peking man. So the same things that we talked about Peking man, which has been known as Sinanthropus pecanisus, uh, and I guess you know where he was found, uh, which is compatible with Homo erectus remains. They look very similar. And this is a, this is a uh, artist rendition on the right-hand side of Peking man. Uh, William Laughlin at the University of Connecticut has studied the Eskimos and the Alouettes extensively and has noticed similar morphologic features with these people in Homo erectus or Peking man. Hope Peking man is also thrown in to the same category as Homo erectus, okay? I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't want to pick on a race or nothing, but I mean, you can see that there's morphologic differences there, but let, let's say uh, between the Eskimo and typical Western European uh, uh, people and look very morphologically similar to Peking man. Peking man was man. He was Homo erectus, he was man. Genetic variability. William Laughlin, we find the significant differences have developed over short time span between closely related and contiguous peoples as in Alaska and Greenland. And we consider the vast differences that exist between remote groups such as Eskimos and Bushmen who are known to belong to the single species of Homo sapiens. Nobody denies that. Everybody says we're all humans. You know, whether you live in Greenland or, 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 uh, or South Africa or, or uh, Australia, 
or, or Alaska, anywhere. We're all human beings and nobody d denies that. Um, so we all belong to the same si single species Homo sapiens. It seems justifiable to conclude that Peking men belong within the same diverse species. He was man. The difference between Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, and Neanderthal can all be explained by genetic variability. Cranial capacities, as we say, vary from 700 cc's all the way to 2200 cc's. The cranial capacity of Homo erectus arranges, uh, varies from 70, 780 to 125, Neanderthal 1200 to six, 1650, and the other differences, other than the differences in the skull capacity between modern man, there's virtually no difference. Homo erectus and Neanderthals constitute what we call Homo sapiens, or humans, and there's no reason to categorize them otherwise. We said this last week, we'll say it again, Australopithecus africanus and afarensis, as well as Homo habilis, were not human and would not belong to, and would belong to the ancient ape or chimpanzee category. That's where I put these people. And that's where, that, that's where I would agree with Lubinol to put these, these findings. Okay, we've got just a few minutes. I wanted to get through this this week, but we probably want to do this justice. But there is a category that we don't, where evolutionists don't know where to put fossil records. So where they, where they lump them in as archaic Homo sapiens. They don't want to say they're Homo sapiens. They're archaic Homo sapiens. And we're going to look at the, the Latoli footprints. You probably haven't heard too much of Latoli footprints, although it's been well studied and documented. A few years ago, I wrote a little uh, article for Truth Magazine on the Paluxy bed footprints. Do you remember that? Were you, were you all in, in the class when I talked about that, the supposed human prints? Interestingly to me is those footprints have not been well documented. And I don't understand that. I still don't understand that to this day. But they're supposed human footprints at the Paluxy Riverbed in uh, Rose Sharon, or uh, not Rose Sharon, uh, Glen Rose, Glen, excuse me, Glen Rose, Texas. Uh, Cherry and I even took a trip down there to try to see those footprints. You can't see them, they're on private property. So all you can see is pictures. But some people have studied them. But it hasn't been extensively studied. The Latoli footprints have been extensively studied. And we'll talk about that next week. But to give you kind of an idea is they look very, very human. But let's talk about archaic Homo sapiens first. A group of fossils from Europe, Africa, and Asia called, uh, have been called the uh, archaic Homo sapiens because they just look like Homo sapiens. They don't fit into Neanderthal or the Homo erectus categories for different reasons, but the, the big reason is they have different skull morphology from the classic Neanderthal. Many of these are dated much earlier than the classic Neanderthal, and the cranial capacity is too large for them to be classified as Homo erectus. But they don't want to call them human either, okay, because they're too old to be human. Too young to be Homo erectus, too old to be human. We're calling them archaic humans. The dates vary. Some of them have been dated as recent as 5,000, but some have been dated as ancient as 700,000. As an evolutionist, I cannot have human beings being around 700,000 years ago. I can't have it, right? Because humans weren't around 700,000 years ago according to their own dating scales and according to their own theory. So if I find a skeletal remain that's dated 700,000 years, what am I automatically going to do as an evolutionist? I'm going to say he isn't human, even if he looks just like us. Do you have a problem with that? I have a big problem with that. Why not? Because it's circular reasoning, and it's a making the big assumption that evolution is true. That's what's happened with these remains. These groups are fully human and part of the human species. The, Ar the archaic Homo sapiens falsify the concept of evolution. Remember what I talked about and how you falsify a, a, a theory last week? This falsifies it, pure and simple. If you didn't know anything else in this class that we talked about the last two weeks, and you knew this, you would know enough. It falsifies it. They're too old by their own dating systems, which I don't agree with again. But the hominid fossil record over the past 300 to 400,000 years offers a remarkable degree of morphologic variety. There's all kinds of variety when you look back at these fossils, and yet late, Persisting Homo erectus aside, conventional wisdom, and Ian, this is Ian uh, Tartasol that says this, uh, late ho uh, persisting Homo erectus aside, he wants to take them out of the equation, conventional wisdom assigns all these fossils to Homo sapiens, albeit of the, of the archaic variety. My, I would put Homo erectus in the same thing. 
He don't want to. This guy doesn't. But he understands these archaic fossils. You know, they look like Homo sapiens to him, albeit of the archaic type. The only reason it's archaic is because of the dates. Keep that in mind. Juan Luis Arswaga, 1992, found undisturbed fossil deposits in a cave in Cima de los Huesos in Spain. Since that time, 32 have been discovered. They're dated about 400,000 years. These remains show a wide degree in variations, just like we have in ourselves today, within a contemporaneous population, within that same population of skulls and skeletal remains is a huge degree of variation. And Marvin Lubinow says that this muddles in the middle all other European fossils that appeared to be so different. Maybe they were so different because of genetic variation, because these skulls were completely different and nobody argues they weren't contemporaneous. They were. Physical variation found in this one assemblage of fossils encompasses all the other European archaic Homo sapiens fossils. They, they all have similarities to Homo erectus, Neanderthal, and Homo sapiens. This extreme variation in population is exactly what we would expect if we were creationists. That's what you would expect, a wide variation, genetic variability, and that's what you see. The distinctions made by evolutionists between Homo erectus, early Homo sapiens, archaic, Neanderthals, and anatomically modern species now fades into insignificance. I think that's it. Nope. And that's what the Bible says. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the earth. We're all of the same blood. And again, Homo erectus, Neanderthal, archaic, homo, uh, archaic uh, homo sapiens were all part of the human uh, species. All right, now we're going to stop there. Uh, uh, let me say uh, the variation in the fossils that can be attributed to non-evolutionary explanations. And it points to the absurdity of trying to attempt species distinctions in human fossils and contrary to what evolutionists may believe, non-evolutionary morphologic changes can take place very quickly due to genetic isolation or the ending of genetic isolation and the resulting in genetic redistribution, and it is extremely difficult to determine genetic relationships after thousands of years have passed. The only legitimate species criteria is a fertility test. That means if they can breed together, they're the same species, and you can't do that with fossils, can you? All right, and now I'm done. Sorry, I thought we were done. So next week, we will look at the Latoli footprints, and we will get into uh, is evolution um, uh, racist.